Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hey, everybody. My name is Mike, grateful recovering alcoholic. And uh, the title of this section is Sobriety 101. Uh, early recovery, and uh, you guys are the experts. Uh, Dave and I have been around for a while, so uh, uh, we're going to just uh, share a little bit with you and then uh, maybe have a little bit of question and answer. We'll see where it goes. Um, we'll see where God takes us. We've uh, done an excruciating amount of preparation for this talk, but uh, again, we'll see where it goes. Uh, let me ask a couple of quick questions here. Uh, how many of you guys are in your first year of sobriety? Wow. That's cool. How many six months? Un, in under six months. Uh, how about under thirty days? Boy, that's awesome. Okay, cool. Um, how many of you guys have a sponsor? Oh, I love it. That's great. Awesome. Okay. How many of you guys have heard "Don't drink and go to meetings"? Okay, great. So, all right. Let me just tell you that's not what we're going to talk about tonight. All right. I know that those people are well-intentioned, they probably care about you dearly, but watch out because they're trying to kill you. All right. Um, don't drink and go to meetings kills more alcoholics than I've, I've, I've ever, more than perhaps anything else. Um, I've met people in the program, I've met people in the rooms who have, I've known folks that have stayed sober 10, 15 years on sheer spite and anger. Um you know, Scotty talked about his ego keeping him, keeping him going, and, you know, it, it, it does serve a useful purpose there. But uh, I, I don't want anything they have. I don't want anything they have, okay? Um, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, my sobriety date is December 2nd, 1990. My home group is Mount Vernon Group of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm also a member of the Heavy Hitters Group of Alcoholics Anonymous, for which I'm all very, very, very grateful um, and this is my friend Dave. Dave, you want to make a quick introduction, and then we'll jump into this thing. I'm Dave, alcoholic. Not my friend; he's my sponsor. Um, there's a difference, and I, I guess first thing I want to say is one of my themes tonight is going to be the difference between being dry, not drinking, not doing drugs, versus being in recovery. And to me, there's a difference. If you're in recovery, you're actively working on your stuff. You're, it's, it's that second thing. You're, you're, you're clean, and you're trying to grow as a human being. Um, my sobriety date is 9-23-91. Um, I first came here in 1999, and I fell in love with this place, and I've been to 17 in a row. I don't miss it. I have to come into a few rocks. I want to be part of it. I want to be part of the whole sponsorship family, sponsorship tree. I went up to Bill Sanders. I said, I'm looking for a different sponsor. I had been eyeballing him. And uh, he said, well, why don't you go talk to Mike? And, and it felt right. He's, he's very different than other people that, I, that I've uh, been sponsored by. He's very comfortable in his own skin. And he um, took me by the hand and made me start all over. And he took my program um, to a new level, and he made me do stuff. Uh, at the time when he became my sponsor, I had two sponsees, and I said to those guys, I right, there's a new sheriff in town, and uh, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back, work step one. I want you to call me every day. And that was about the last I heard of those two guys. Um, so I now sponsor people the way he sponsors me, and two of my sponsees are here, and uh, I, for that I'm real grateful. Um, and at this point, I'll let Mike take back over. Thank you, Dave. Um, you know, what we're going to talk about tonight is really, uh, it, it says in the big book, it says the spiritual life is not a theory. You have to live it. Okay? Um, have any of you all ever seen the book Living Sober? If you haven't, get it. Okay? If, if, uh, I went to a Living Sober meeting very early in my sobriety, and it was a very important part of my early recovery. Um, it has some very practical things that you can do in there about staying sober, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about the literature. But what we're talking about here, when we say the spiritual life is not a theory you have to live it is, is that this is about living, 
about living sober. I don't know about you guys, but I quit drinking at least a thousand times. Probably plenty of times more than that. My problem wasn't quitting drinking. Now, it, I was drinking a bottle, uh, a quart, really, of Evan Williams a day. I'm a bourbon drinker. Um, that's my, uh, that's my favorite substance on the planet. Ever since I got sober, they've come up with all these new things that you can drink. Dry beers, iced beers, hard, hard ciders, unhard ciders. I don't know what all they got. But, uh, I drank, a, I was drinking a bottle of bourbon a day when I got here and I could not stop drinking. I could quit. But by 4.30 in the afternoon, I was back drinking every day, you know, and I would beg God to help me, and I just was, couldn't find the willingness to stop drinking. And what we're talking about is how to, be a, how, to, how to stay sober and be a good husband, a boyfriend, an employer, a friend, a son, a brother. Whatever it is, we are called upon to be members of society. We're called to live sober. Um, if, if you think that the, the way you stay sober is to hide out in AA meetings, it doesn't work. It's nice to have an hour of serenity a day, but it just doesn't work. Um, you can't hide out in AA meetings. That's not where life is. That's where, that's where you hear the message. That's where you find out who the winners are you hang out with. Okay? We're going to talk about tonight about living in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Not living in the fellowship, but living in the program. Let's start off with um, my favorite page in the big book. And anybody who knows me knows that this is my favorite page in the big book. And I read it every opportunity I get, and I read it to folks. It's on page 25. It says, there is a solution. And almost none of us like the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, the confession of shortcomings, which the process requires for its successful consummation. The process, of course, is getting sober and staying sober and finding a spiritual relationship and a spiritual experience with a higher power. But we saw that it really worked in others and we came to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life had we been living it. When, therefore, we were approached by those in whom the problem had been solved, there was nothing left for us but to pick up the simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet. We have found much of heaven and we've been rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence which we had not even dreamed. The great fact is just this and nothing less, that we've had deep and effective spiritual experiences which have revolutionized our whole attitude toward life, toward our fellows, and toward God's universe. The central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered into our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. He has commenced to accomplish those things for which we could never do by ourselves. Now, let me start off here. If you look at this, it says, when we were approached by those in whom the problem had been solved. Okay, a couple of things had to happen here. First of all, we had to be somewhere where we could be approached by someone who had the problem had been solved. So usually that means somebody's either come bailed our butt out of jail, um, come to, you know, wherever we were in our sniveling, pity, self-pitying, self, uh, self-defeating places, or we, we were at an AA meeting. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I, on December 2nd, 1990, my ex, now ex, and she's actually a pretty good friend of mine today, um, my, uh, my daughter's mother, uh, basically I came home and found her with some friends, um, I guess they call that an intervention, and pretty much she said, you're either a pathological liar or a hopeless alcoholic. Little does she know that I was both. Right? She packed up the bags and left. And I did the only thing that I could, uh, an alcoholic of my type would do. It was Sunday. I only had that much booze left in the bottle, so I went up to Hooters. And I said I was watching the football game. I drank three bottles, of, three bottles, of, uh, three long neck bottles of Bud. I couldn't get drunk and I couldn't stay sober. You know that's an awful place. You can't get drunk and you can't stay sober. Okay? So, the next day, I kind of moped around. I didn't drink that day until I got off of work. And then at the end of the day, I went up to the bookstore. And there was a, I was looking for something about alcoholism. They had this book. It was wrapped in blue plastic or plastic, clear plastic. It was this blue book. And it said Alcoholics on the, not Anonymous on it. And I couldn't get that book because it had the word alcoholic on it. And I couldn't be an alcoholic. The alcoholic was the guy who drove the drunk car into the house or into the driveway of the house across the street and went home and beat up his wife every night. He was an alcoholic because he walked in the house with his brown bag. I carried my bottle into the in, in my briefcase, thank you very much. Um, 
How we doing? I'm, I'm there. I'm there. Okay. They, they want to make sure we keep on our plan. Um, the, the, where I'm going with all of this is, is that I discovered that I was an alcoholic, and when I said I was an alcoholic, the, wor- the weight of the world was lifted off my shoulder. So the next day, I went in to see my boss. I would made the decision after all of this, I was going to put myself in the hospital. And when you do things like that, your boss kind of wants to know that you're not going to be around. Now, this was the guy that in this last year of my drinking had become my boss, and I hated his guts because at one point in time, we were going to kill each other, physically kill each other. And then he became my boss. You know, Jimmy Smith used to say it gets worse and worse and worse. And he became my boss. And I went in to tell him I was going to the hospital. And he stood up, he put his hand across the table, and he said, well, congratulations, I'm one too. The reason he became my boss is because he'd been sober for four and a half years. That's what happens to you when you're sober. And he also became my first sponsor. Because not only did he, um, could he relate to me as an alcoholic, but he also went through a divorce in early sobriety, which is very, very difficult. So... A lot of you guys wonder, what is a sponsor? Why do I need to get a sponsor? A sponsor is who walks you through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. He's not a banker. He's not a lender. He might take you to meetings. He might not take you to meetings. The key point is is that your sponsor has what you want. In other words, he is someone in whom the problem has been solved. And typically the sponsor will help you figure out how to work the deal, deal with these spiritual tools laid at your feet. Now, when should you talk to your sponsor? You should talk to your sponsor when the wheels are coming off. You should talk to your sponsor when they're not coming off. Okay? Um, I, was, I was told early on to call my sponsor every day. Why was that? Well, the reason is because there was a time when that ex of mine pushed the button that I had this big around on my chest and I was ready to take a drink. I was madder than a wet snake, and I was ready to take a drink. And I can remember to this day, it was raining. I was standing on the side of Roswell Road, and back then they had pay phones. And I remembered my sponsor's phone number because it had been burned into my forehead because I'd been having to call him every day. You know, if you make something like that a habit, then when it becomes necessary to do it, you haven't forgotten. And I didn't get drunk that night, okay? Now, the time you call your sponsor is before, not after, because at about... Uh, five months sober, <clears throat> the judge finally signed a piece of paper in the case of Boatwright v. Boatwright, and I was no I was freed from the bondage of my marriage, or not myself, but my marriage. And the problem was, is I decided that uh, I ought to go celebrate at Tattletales, and I didn't. I kind of pretended to call my sponsor, but I really was hoping he wasn't there, and I convinced some friends to go with me to to, to Tattletales that night. Four of us went. I called him the next day to tell him what had happened. And Rob said, listen. He said, I did the same thing. He said, let me warn you about what's going to happen. He said, about the next day or so, in the next 24 hours or so, you might have some urges to drink. It happened to me. And he was right. I did. Thank God he shared that with me. Because the other three people, and I'm not proud of this, the other three people went out and got drunk. Okay, we didn't drink that night, but we got, but they got drunk. Now, by the grace of God, I stayed sober, and I learned an important lesson. You call your sponsor before, not after. Okay? Now, there's one other very important thing that I want to talk about sponsorship, and, you know, usually we have a whole workshop on sponsorship. But this is very important about living sober. If you have to yell at somebody, yell at your sponsor. Don't yell at your boss. Don't yell at your wife. Okay? Don't kick the dog. Yell at your sponsor. Uh, it's amazing. Your sponsor will probably understand because he's yelled at his sponsor. And you might not end up with your butt in jail as a result. Um, you know, they, they, I've heard of countless stories of alcoholics sober and, or trying to get sober getting thrown in jail because they popped off and said something they ought not to have, to whom they ought not to have, like that fellow whose name is Sir and has a gun on his belt, right? Don't yell at him. Yell at your sponsor, okay? Now, there's another important thing about sponsorship, and it leads into what we talk about up here. It says we can do what I cannot, um, and that is is that this is a we program. This is a we program. So I'm going to turn it over to Dave for a few minutes to talk about the we part of Alcoholics Anonymous. 
I'm the more anal time guy, so uh, I'm going to try and relax if, if Mike goes over. we got to do the whole thing in 70 minutes, which is tough for me because I could, you know, tell you about my eighth grade drug and alcohol experience for 70 minutes. Um, for me, sponsorship, pure and simple, is a spiritual activity because when I got into these rooms, I was a very high bottom I was fine. How you doing? I'm fine. Do you have any problems? No, I'm fine. So when somebody told me what sponsorship was, it didn't make any sense to me because I know how to do this kind of relationship where we're equals. I know how to do this where I'm up top and they're down here, but I didn't know how to do this where I ask someone to be in charge of me. I ask someone to tell me what to do. That to me is a spiritual, humbling activity, and I found it very powerful, and I've never not had a sponsor. I don't know if anybody here is fighting that idea that you're here and they're there, but that's the truth. When I ask someone, do you have a sponsor, and they say, well, I've been around a while. Me and Joe, we kind of sponsor each other. I both cringe and, and try and get away from that person. You can't have that mutual sponsorship stuff. It, it, it's not, it's, you're not equals. You're not. All right. Go up to your boss and say, hey, you know, I'd like to change our relationship. I'd like to be more peer like with you. You OK with that? Most bosses are going to say no. Um, and the other thing you need to understand is, is this is what started AA is Bill Wilson was going around trying to sponsor people. And I'm going to assume some of you know the story, some of you don't. He, he caught fire with, 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 with the Oxford group and religion and tried to give away what he had and he kept on sponsoring people trying to get him into the program. And without fail, everybody he was sponsoring was going out and getting drunk. And he comes home one night, and he's all bummed out. And his wife says, well, what's the matter? And he says, remember, you know, Sam, the one we were, like, thinking was going to make it? Well, Sam's drunk. And he turns to his wife. He says, this isn't working. And to me, AA began when the wife, Lois, turns to Bill and says, it is working. He goes, what are you talking about? She goes, it is working. You haven't had a drink. All right. And the point is, 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 is when you use us as a sponsor, you're helping us a lot, a whole lot. OK. So I don't think you could do it alone. And, and my latest thing about about AA, my latest belief system, which I think is one of the core beliefs, is, is when you start out, you're over here. It's a social activity. You drink and drug. I don't know about you guys, but to me, it was a party. We used to call it partying. My first drink was a bunch of guys in the woods. My first smoking uh, weed w w was, was with, w with one buddy. And I couldn't imagine ever using by myself. And when I heard that people used to get high by themselves, I used to think that was weird. And I drew a line. I would never do that. I'm never going to drink by myself. I'm never going to get high by myself. And like any good alcoholic, you know, I cross that line. And I just erase the line. I make a new line. So it starts out, we're very social creatures. It's a party. And then what happens, guys? We get to this point where we're using by ourselves and drinking by ourselves and hiding. We don't want to share anymore. It's a secret. And we get sick all by ourselves. And the way we heal, I think we come back in this direction. We go back to the social stuff. We, we get sick in private. We heal in public. Um, our speaker tonight, Scotty, said, and I wrote it down, whiskey done for me what I could not do for myself. Gave him that feeling of being okay. And now we have a new saying. We can do. Okay? We can do it for us. We can do what I couldn't. All right? We get better. I don't get better. We get better. There's a story about this guy, and, he, and he's feeling very squirrely. He calls a sponsor up. Says to his sponsor, I'm having a rough time. Sponsor says, what's going on? He goes, I don't know. I feel like I'm climbing out of my skin. I feel like I'm going crazy. I feel like I want to drink. I feel like I want to do drugs. I feel like uh, I'm a mess. And the sponsor says, where are you? The guy says, I'm in my apartment. The sponsor says, who, 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 who's in the apartment? He goes, nobody. I'm here by myself. The sponsor says, quick, get out of the apartment. You're in there with a crazy person. All right? And if you guys are um, listening to the tape, the audience is hysterical right now with the microphones not picking it up. Um, when I was in treatment, I was told the first six meetings I went to to get six phone numbers and call those six people. That was very, very 
very hard for me to do, and I'm a fairly social guy. I felt like an idiot getting a phone number, and I felt like an idiot calling that person up that night or the next day. Hey, Steve, remember me? I'm that guy Dave from the meeting. I'm supposed to call you. And my goal was to get off the phone as soon as possible. But what generally would happen is these guys would say, so what's going on? Start talking to me. And 45 minutes later, I'd hang the phone up, and I'd be pissed because it took 45 minutes to get off the phone. That happened time and time again. Eventually, I got used to asking for phone numbers. Um, when I started being sponsored by Mike, he wanted me to call him every day. I thought that was ridiculous. I had like eight and a half years sober, and I thought that was beneath me. But it was the best thing I ever did because I, it, I built up that muscle. And I was able to call him every day. And when I needed him, it was absolutely without effort to call him up and say, hey, I'm having a rough day. <laughs> So call people when you're in crisis, but also learn to call people when you're not in crisis. And I think the more you call people when you're not in crisis, the less crises are going to occur. Um, make some sober friends. All right? They talk about changing playgrounds, playmates, and playthings. There's a reason. All right? Very few people can stay sober if you hang around people who are getting high, drunk, wasted, a little bit buzzed, very buzzed, etc. It's tough. It's tough. Um, there's a point when you get enough time where you can hang out with people who are drinking, but I promise you, once you get to that point, you're not going to want to hang out with people who are drinking. I like people to be on my level. You know? Um, <clears throat> like I said, pick out, pick out some winners. Hang out with people that want what you have. Um, and I guess, you know, the last thing I'm going to say is, you know, I have kids. One of the skills I try and teach my kids is to say, I need help. Teach them it's okay to say, I need help. Teach them it's okay to say, I don't know. I don't know about you guys. I think that's a skill a lot of us are lacking. All right? I need help. It's okay to say that. I can't do this by myself. I don't know how to do this. Will you show me how to do this? Um, it's an honor when we get asked those kind of questions. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Mike. Okay, so you got a sponsor. He's dragging your back into meetings. You're starting to make some friends in the program. Maybe you're going bowling every so often. Anybody been bowling yet? Okay. Oh, man, and that kid, that kid, man, we used to go from Naba Club to Northwest Lanes and back to Naba Club, and I mean, we were just all over the place. Oh. Okay, we were all over the place. It was it was a blast. Okay, I tell you what, hanging out with sober people, you know, it talks a big buck, but we're not a glum lot. We actually have a pretty good bit of fun if we let ourselves do it. Why is that? Well, because we're full of enthusiasm. Does anybody know what the word enthusiasm means? In, which means with, and theus, which means God. So if you've if you're trying to live a spiritual way of life, you're enthusiastic and you're having a good time. And you're running around with people that also want to have a good time and are sober. All right, so you've got new playmates and new playgrounds. You've got a sponsor. Now, don't get me wrong, meetings are very important, okay? Why, why are meetings important? Well, for one thing, if you're going to the right kinds of meetings, you're, you are starting to learn the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. I recommend, this is just Mike, but I recommend that you go to the meetings where people carry the message, not the mess. Okay, I remember a meeting I went to, started going to fairly early in the program, um, that at about a year into my sobriety, actually made a conscious decision in the group where half the group split off because they wanted to talk about the problem. The other half of the group wanted to talk about the solution. Okay, I recommend you go to meetings to talk about the solution. Now, my grand sponsor, and oh, by the way, Scotty talked about his sponsor. Um, my sponsor, I have two sponsors, OKS. And Bill S., the big guy on the stage here a little while ago, um, they both have sponsors. Okay, sponsor is Dick A., and Bill's sponsor is um, also Dick A. and also Dick Martin out in Nebraska. Dick Martin is sponsored by Clancy I., and I think Clancy's sponsored by God um, or something like that. I don't know. I, I, I lose track after that. Um, I, I will tell you, though, that that's where you go to meet. Sponsors. That's where you find sponsors. And oh, by the way, I go to meetings to find newcomers. That's what keeps me sober. 
Okay, and I like to go to meetings for the newcomers. I go to a meeting on Saturday mornings. Um, those of you guys in Atlanta, you might want to join me there sometime as the Triangle Men's Meeting on Saturday mornings at 9 o'clock. The reason I like to go to that meeting is because you got to sit next to each other, a guy with 24 hours, 24 days, and 24 years. That's pretty awesome. That's the kind of meetings I like to go to. Now, if you're going to go to a meeting, and I recommend you do that every day. In fact, uh, I remember when they put me out of Peachford Hospital, and they gave me this little thing called a discharge sheet, and they said, you know, you got to go to 90 meetings in 90 days, and I went, nope, and way. You know, uh, there was no way I was going to 90 meetings in 90 days. I went out, ended up going to 189 meetings in 90 days. Um, I turned out I was a little sicker than I thought. Um, the wheels were coming off. I was going through a divorce. There was one day when she took the stuff out of the, out of the house that I went to five meetings that day. It saved my life. Okay? It can save your life. I recommend if you're going to go to a meeting that you go to the meeting early. Why do you do that? Because that's where all the sober people are. They're at the meetings and they're there early. Okay, they told me not only to go to 90 meetings in 90 days, but go 20 and 20. Anybody ever heard of going 20 and 20? Go to meetings 20 minutes early and say at least 20 minutes late. Now, when I got to, I, I got sober sort of bouncing between Triangle and Nava Club in Atlanta. And what I would do when I got to the meeting is I would stand there and I'd go, okay, I don't know anybody. I can't talk to anybody. I'm scared to death. Somebody get me sober. It doesn't work that way. And then thank God, you know, thank God that uh, we don't smoke anymore in the meetings, but thank God back when I was getting sober they did because they told me to clean up ashtrays, and that saved my tail. And they told me to make coffee. And I'd be sitting there making coffee, and if you've ever been to Nava Club, you know they have these humongous urns of coffee, and it takes a lot of effort to make that coffee, and you're sitting there, and you're busy, and your hands, and you're not going crazy, and you're not drinking, and you're not doing da 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 right? And all of a sudden, I'm starting to talk to people, and I'm starting to come out of my own shell. I'm starting to be, starting, just starting to be okay with myself, okay? Now, in addition to the 20 and 20, you know, the reason you go to the meeting 20 minutes early is because that's when you get, after you've left, the meeting before the meeting. And you should go into the meeting before the meeting. What's the meeting before the meeting? Well, I don't know. In my case, uh, what do we do, Brendan? We get together, we go to, uh, to what, China Palace, or we'll go to Chips, or something like that. A lot of times, you know, if you go to an 8 o'clock meeting, you get together with your sober friends. Great time to meet with sponsor. Great time to meet with sponsees. Okay. Um, and then you go to your home group. You guys have a home group? You guys know what a home group is? You know, a home group is where I have to ask my sponsor for permission not to go. That's what a home group is. Okay? I have to ask my sponsor for permission not to go. I let him know if I'm not going to be there. And the guys that go to the meeting that, spon that I sponsor tell me, hey, I'm not going to be there. You know, and that's pretty cool. You know, sorry, I'm not, I, I have got to work tonight. Or I've got to do something or I'm sick or whatever. But I don't, ordinarily, I have permission to be there. I'm also active in the group, which means that's a good place to, like, take a coffee commitment. Okay? What's a commitment do? It makes you responsible. Guess what? That's how we start to get sober, by being responsible. Okay? You also start to take an active, you start to actively participate in your group. If your home group has a group conscience meeting in the next month, be there. If they have a group conscious meeting in the next two months, three months, four months, whatever, be there. Why? Because you're part of something bigger than any of us. What is it Bill sometimes, often says? Uh, I think it was Doc or maybe uh, Bill Hollingsworth, one of these guys said, did it ever occur to you that you're part of something really big? Now, I felt really small when I first got to Alcoholics Anonymous. I had no self-esteem. Where did I start to get self-esteem? By doing esteemable things. How do you do esteemable things? Because you were responsible. People counted on me to have the coffee when they got to the meeting. Right? That's kind of cool. That's actually, golly, nobody counted on me for a long time when I was drinking. All right? Now, go to your meetings when you're in crisis. Go to meetings when you're not in crisis. Go to lots of different kinds of meetings. Dick Martin requires the guys that Bill sponsors go to big book meeting a week to step or big book, you know, a, a literature meeting. Um, we're allowed to go to a discussion meeting, okay? So we need to be going to different kinds of meetings. Um, if you just go where people whine about 
their problems, you're not going to get sober. You're going to get sober where people are working through the program together in the meeting, okay? If it's based in the literature, people are working the program. I love going to the heavy hitters group and hearing somebody whine about something and somebody will say, where is that in the book? Uh, you don't whine long, something like that. Okay. One last thing about meetings, go to the meeting after the meeting. Um, I love I love Mount Vernon because people are usually hanging around that place an hour after the place closes, after the meeting closes. That's cool. And then they get together and they go out to eat or they'll go for coffee or go for whatever. That's the meeting after the meeting. Now, what happens if you're doing all of this? Okay, you're staying sober in the in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, it says here, this is where we were, this is when we get that approached by those that, in whom the problem had been solved, that we have but to pick up that kit of spiritual tools. Now, what's Bill talking about here, guys? He's talking about the steps. Now, to me, that's a really great image, that kit of spiritual tools, because the great thing about having a kit of spiritual tools, some of you all have heard me say, I'm grateful that I'm an alcoholic. Now, I know that you guys that are here with less than a year or whatever are not feeling very grateful about being an alcoholic. But let me tell you something. I have a toolkit that most 98% of the people on this planet do not have. Okay? Most of the people running around this planet are clueless about how to deal with things like, you know, uh, problems with their kids or problems with their relationships or problems with their bosses or loss of a job or how to just keep going down that straight and narrow path every day and not want to tear somebody's head off or whatever, you know. Most people don't have this, this kit of spiritual tools. You know, I love it when somebody says, well, so you got this problem. What step are you working on it? Okay, now 99 times out of 100 for me, that step is not accepting the fact that I'm powerless over the situation and then I have to deal with what can I change and what can't I change. Good old first step stuff, right? And then a big chunk of things I've been working on lately are realizing that God is so much bigger than me that he can do it and I can't, right? Now, you work, there's a temptation... A lot of guys, you know, I remember when I first went up and I wanted to get that book, you know, I wanted to find out about alcoholism. And so I, instead of getting the book of, that had the word alcoholic Anonymous on the spine, I got this other book about treatment center stuff. And as I'm reading this book and it's talking about alcoholics and I'm reading the pages and I'm looking more and more and I'm like, oh, my God, this is my story. This is my story. This is my story. And then it says, and it was written, by the way, by a guy named Dr. Vernon Johnson, who was one of the founders of the whole 28-day treatment program, along with Conway Hunter, and, and who founded Peachford Hospital and some others. What he said was basically that the only way that he ever saw that alcoholics got sober was through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And dadgummit, he didn't put them in the book. I was ready to work them right then that night. Now, how would I have worked those steps that night? I would have worked them in my head. You can't work them in your head. As Scotty said, there are actions that you take. How do you take those actions? You have a sponsor. How many times when Scotty was talking about going through the steps with Kip. Did he talk about Kip? Okay. And he talked about Don. And he talked about the guys that walked him through the steps. Why? Because I can't tell you how to get sober. I cannot tell you. But I can tell you how I got sober, and I can tell you how I worked the steps. I can't tell you how to work the steps, so I can tell you how I did. All right? Now, as we're, the key thing in all of this is to be seeking God. And you kind of wonder, well, how can I be seeking God when I'm not even sure who God is? How can I meditate when I'm still shaking? Um, well, look for God in your daily life. You know, whatever it is. If you made it through 24 hours without drinking, thank God for it. Because I don't know about you, but I couldn't do that before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. If you are struggling with, with spirituality, pray to have the barriers to spirituality removed. It works. If you're struggling with willingness, pray for willingness. It works. Okay? The whole key thing here is, is when you make that decision is to clean house. Okay? And you'll be amazed what happens when you clean house. It's like all this stuff comes out of the woodwork. And this is what the steps and how we stay sober. Two minutes. Good. Then we talk about help others. Okay? Now, service, I've already talked about a good bit. You can start working the 12th step immediately after coming into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, be careful because it talks about in the 12 and 12 about, you know, two-steppers. Uh, two 
You can't carry a message that you don't have. But anybody who stayed sober for a couple of 24 hours has something. I talk to guys. Brandon can, can vouch for this because I poked him in, the, in the, the stomach the other night. And I said, go get that new guy. Okay? He's got some time now. And he stayed sober. And the new guy can relate to him more than he can relate to me with a few years of sobriety. You know, you go, you, who? I can't. But, man, how did you stay sober for, for three months? Good grief. Ninety days? I couldn't stay sober for 90 days when I first got sober. I don't know about you guys. Okay, so you do have something to share, and you can start doing that right away. And by the way, most of us know how to make coffee, and most of us know how to pick up and straighten chairs and things like that. You know, we're we're pretty, some of us get rock bottom, but we're not that rock bottom yet. Okay? Reach out to the new guys. You do have something to sponsor, something to offer. And then as you work the steps, the other thing that I nudge guys with is, I notice guys that are working the steps, and all of a sudden they're not like, you know, that question, how many guys are willing to serve as a sponsor for somebody, and they don't put their hand up, and it's like, wait a second, you've worked the steps, how come you're not putting your hand up? Just There's no rule that says you have to have this much time to sponsor somebody. If you are actively immersed in the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and you are working this program, part of that work in this program is sponsoring people. Okay? Now, what happens when you do all of this? Guess what? You're in the middle of the bed. Now, what does the middle of the bed mean? Middle of the bed, if you're in the middle of the bed, it's hard to fall out on either side. Now, for me, part of being in the middle of the bed is keeping people on either side of me. Because if I roll over, I'm rolling over on you. I'm not rolling over on the side of the bed. Now, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dave again. We're kind of bouncing back and forth. This is going to sound really weird on the tape. He's going to talk about middle of the bed for a little bit. Thank you. Middle of bed means a lot to me because I know if I'm here in the middle and this is the bed, I got a lot of room and, and I'm going to stay sober. Now I'm going to stay sober. I'm going to stay happy, healthy, whole, feel alive, feel good, and, and, and do to me that second part of recovery, which is not only am I not drinking and doing drugs, I'm happy, I'm whole, I'm connected to others. It's a question I like to ask myself, and it goes like this. Am I in relapse or am I in recovery? Ask yourself that question no less than 427 times a day if you're having a rough time. Am I in relapse or am I in recovery? Am I moving towards a drink or away from a drink? They drilled that into me in treatment. You don't hear it a lot in meetings. But ask yourself that, because my belief Using the same thing, I'm, uh, the same bed over here, let's just change it to make this putting a drink or a drug into our body, okay? If I'm here and I start doing this, moving towards the edge, I am in relapse right now. I haven't taken a drink or a drug, but as soon as I start moving in that direction, I'm in relapse. Does that make sense? You guys, you know, they're still teaching that in, in treatment centers? Are you, you, got, you guys aware of that? My belief is if I'm doing this, moving away from the drink, I'm okay. If I feel myself doing this, I have 323 opportunities to say, whoa, stop, and come back in this direction. Can't do it alone. If I'm not sure if I'm in relapse or recovery, I'll talk to my sponsor. I'll talk to my friend. I'll ask someone, how, you know, how do you think I'm doing? And they'll ask me some questions, and we'll figure it out together. If you're in the middle of the bed, you know it because you don't. You, drinking and drugging ain't, ain't, ain't an option. Drinking and drugging ain't it ain't there. A lot of you that raise your hand with less than six months. If you're still experiencing cravings, and they're not going away, they're getting worse, not better. You're doing this. You need to be heading in this direction. If you're working a program, the cravings are gonna go away. That's not a, a maybe. That's a statement. If you stay working a program, your obsession to use will disappear. I have had weeks, I've had a month where I don't think about it. I used to not have five minutes. I'll have weeks go by where I don't even think about drinking or drugging. Because I'm trying to stay right here and I'm often succeeding. How do you stay in the middle of bed? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list very quickly the things we need to be doing. All right? It's an overwhelming list. You don't need to do all 17 of them. You could do one, two, or three, or four of them and feel okay. 
The list starts out pretty simple, and it, and it stays pretty simple. All right, go to meetings. Have a sponsor. Talk to the sponsor. So some people that have sponsors, don't talk to them. Do what the sponsor says to do, okay? Have a list of numbers to call on you. Call the list. Talk to people in the program. When you're in crisis, talk to people in the program when you're not in crisis. Hang out with people in recovery. Go have fun with people in recovery. Work on a specific step. Have a home group. Read the literature. Okay? Big book. Came to Believe. Living Sober. Daily meditation books. Go to meetings early and stay late. Prayer and meditation daily. If you don't know how to do it, keep on trying. Praying for most people is easier than meditating. It's amazing to me they talk about prayer and meditation every time they read the 12 steps, but nobody ever tells you how to meditate. If you don't know, ask. There are books, How to Meditate. There's a book I like called Zen and Recovery, and one of the last chapters is How to Meditate. It's about 20 pages long, and it tells you everything you need to know. Do service work. It can include making coffee and cleaning up, it could be more complicated, more advanced, like join H&I, hospital institution groups. Go and give away what you got. Um, no matter what you're doing, if you're doing service work, you're getting away from yourself. That self-centeredness is part of our problem. Anybody else in here self-centered? Anybody? Okay. Um, that, that, that's what we are. We're a bunch of selfish, self-centered people. The world revolves around us. And when I first got in these rooms, this, you know, this is, if I may talk about me for a moment, um, I'm an only child. And I thought my self-centeredness was because I didn't have any brothers or sisters, and I had a mom and a dad and a grandmother who hovered around me. And then I walk into AA, and I see everybody else is selfish and self-centered, and I was amazed at the number of only children there were in the world. And then I found out most of you guys have brothers and sisters. It was shocking to me. Um, Actively work on gaining more spirituality. How do you do that? Any way you can, guys. Actively work on getting more spirituality in your life. It's a feeling. If you don't got it, try. You'll get it eventually. A guy named Dal, a triangle, used to say, if you hang out long enough, you will be contacted. Okay? You will get it. If you don't have it right now, that's fine. Just don't stop looking. Reach out to newcomers. Sponsor somebody. All right? The easiest prayer around is in the morning, say, please keep me sober. And the end of the, day, the end of the day, say, thank you for keeping me sober. If that's all you're doing, that's great. Okay? If you're not feeling the God thing, pray for God to remove the barriers to spirituality. And I promise you, you'll start feeling more of that God consciousness. Last thing I want to say about stay in the middle of bed is uh, my old mentor, Tom Butcher, used to teach me to ask, is this good for me or is this good for my disease? All right? If I'm about to go to Tattletales with my future ex-sponsor over there, I'm going to say to myself, is this good for me or is this good for my disease? And I know what the answer is. And the answer is, is this good for my disease? I don't need to be going. All right? If I'm going to go out with that woman that I met you know, the one with 29 days sober, but, you know, a very nice body. Should I go out with her? Is that good for me or good for my disease? Got to ask yourself that question. All right. Um, just one word about relationships that I like to say. Looking for relationships in AA is like hanging around bankruptcy court looking for business partners. Okay. Um, it's tough. It's tough. My last major piece that I want to talk about is not out of the big book. It's uh, it, it's my thing, and it's and it, real briefly, it, it's called feelings. I don't know if any of you guys are having any experience with feelings, but when I walked in these rooms, I read about feelings. I had heard about them, but I thought they were a bunch of crap. I thought my brain could get me out of any jam. That I, that I was ever in. I thought I could think my way to happiness, think my way to good relationships, think my way to wealth, success, friends, you name it. So what I do today is I draw a line right here at my chin. And from my chin up is where I think, and from my chin down is where I feel. All right? 
I'm going to say this probably more than once. To me, addiction and alcoholism is a disease of not feeling. I'll say it again. It's a disease of not feeling. We don't like the way we feel. We're not comfortable in our own skin. We have four and a half Budweiser's and all of a sudden we're okay. And we're better looking and we're more social and we're smarter. We're better dancers. Okay? Um, I was more into drugs and Budweiser's and I found certain combinations would make me feel very good. My second sponsor, he once told me that the first time he ever stuck a needle in his arm and pulled the plunger down, the first thing he said to himself is, gee, this feels great. And then he said, but now that I have a few years sober, I look back and what I really was experiencing was once that plunger hit the bottom of the syringe, what I was experiencing was now I'm not feeling anything. Okay? Nothing. Um, in Atlanta, there's a radio station. I, I don't know if it's not, I think it's 96 Rock, but they don't, you know, they changed it, but it used to be like all Pink Floyd all the time. And whenever I would look for music, I'd always, you know, hit on 96 Rock, and they always were playing that Pink Floyd song, Comfortably Numb. All right? That was, that was my mantra. Comfortably Numb. I, I was a big remote control guy. I used to have like, you know, uh, my stereo, my TV, my, my ceiling fan, my lights, everything were remote control. I used to sit on the couch and I used to get my drugs and my drink and, and I used to like sit there for hours and I used to fantasize about getting a catheter hooked up so I wouldn't have to get up off the couch. And, and I used to sit there for, and I used to say, man, I'm living. This is the good life, man. I'm really, this is, this is great. All right. And what I was doing, I was just numb. I was flat. I think life takes place at a feeling level. Okay? As I said before, I'm a father. That's a big part of what I do. And when I'm with my kids, it's about connection. It's about feelings. Teaching them how to have feelings, me having my own feelings, and let's experience life together at a feeling level. It ain't a thought. It ain't a thinking process. Being a son, being a friend, being a teacher, being being a student, it, it, to me it happens down in my body. Okay? Um... Real briefly, the feelings are, all right, mad, sad, glad, and scared. Those are your four biggies. Mad, sad, glad, and scared. If I took you to Piedmont Hospital, to the newborn unit, I could show you four babies. One's mad, one's sad, one's happy, and one's scared. We're born with those feelings. The next two feelings are alone and connected. When you're born, you don't know the difference between alone and connected because, you, you know, babies don't know. They don't know where they begin, their mom ends. They don't know where they begin, the crib ends. But eventually they figure out, if I'm crying, no one's picking me up, I'm all alone, and they don't like that. And then they figure out, if I get picked up and it feels all warm and soft, they like that. Alone and connected are the next two big feelings, okay? In AA, we connect with each other. Out there, drinking and drugging, we're all alone, seeking out that connection. Does that make sense? Do you remember drinking, turning to some guy you barely knew, saying, you are probably the greatest guy I've ever met in my whole life. I love you, man. Or someone that you, that you really knew well, next thing you know, you're like slobbering on him. You know? Did I ever tell you that you know, I just think you're the best friend I've ever had? And I think we have this need to connect, that we need the alcohol to kind of lower our guards enough so then we connect with others. But now in recovery, it's all about connection, man. It's all about connection. And if you're not feeling it, if you're feeling alone in recovery, my prediction is you ain't going to stick around. If you're feeling alone in recovery, ask for help. I don't know how to do this. Help me. There are blocks to feelings. And again, this, this ain't out of the big book. This is, this is me speaking. And if I offend anybody, I apologize. But to me, feelings are what makes this stuff happen. All right? I'm aware of seven blocks to feelings. Men have a harder time with feelings than women. All right? Smart people have a harder time with feelings than less smart people. The interesting thing is nobody in this room thinks, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm one of those dumb people, so I should be feeling. Everybody thinks we're smart. We're all a bunch of smart people. But if we like our, the way our brain works, if we know what two plus two is, we like it up here, you know? How do you do friendship? Well, that's down here. That's, a, that's vague. I'd rather stay up here. Ask me a square root of nine. Come on, ask me a square root of nine. I know that. Um, if we have addiction in our lives, 
We're not dealing with feelings. If, while growing up, we grew up in a dysfunctional family where we didn't get our needs met emotionally, we don't want to deal with feelings. And for our purposes, a dysfunctional family is defined by any family with two or more people in it. No, I'm only kidding. Um, if you had trauma growing up, if you saw some bad stuff happening, it cuts you off from your feelings. And I also think certain professions, certain jobs lend themselves to not feeling. Accountants, most lawyers, engineers, you know, if you're getting into that kind of head job up here in your brain, you don't, you don't get to your feelings a lot. And then this list used to stop, and then somebody said to me, wait a minute, in my family, my dad was from Ireland, my mom was from Scotland, they don't deal with feelings in those cultures. So I think the last block to feelings is a cultural thing. There's, a, there's, a, 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 there's some confusion in my mind about anger in recovery. You often hear you're not supposed to be angry. I think that's wrong. I think we are a bunch of angry people. We need, we need not walk, work, walk around with resentments. We need not walk around holding our anger in. We need to figure out how to let it out. Now, rage is the thing we can't afford. Rage is when anger gets to the point where we're out of control. But all anger is a feeling. And what I preach to people is if you got some anger, go get rid of it. The best way to get rid of it is through some kind of physicality, movement, yelling, screaming, throwing things. Don't throw things at another person. Throw things at a wall. Take a baseball bat, beat the hell out of a tree. It feels good. You're allowed to do that. Um, last thing I want to say about feelings is um, I think we as a people, not necessarily alcoholics, I think humans in America today have trouble with being assertive. All right, And we as alcoholics, I think, are particularly prone towards having trouble in, the, in, in taking care of ourselves assertively. And what I mean by that is Imagine a continuum where this side over here is passive, the middle is assertive, and down here is aggressive. All right? So there's passive behavior, assertive behavior, aggressive behavior. Where in here, that middle assertiveness, that's the healthy way to go. Okay? Most people, I think, function passively, and we get, we get, we get pushed around, and we sit on it, we sit on it, we sit on it. Passive, 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 and then boom, we flip right into the aggressive stuff. And we bypass that middle ground of assertiveness. I don't know if that's making sense to you guys. If I'm on a bus to a Braves game and every time the bus starts, the guy in front of me takes a step back, steps on my toe, but he doesn't know it. I don't say anything. Bus starts, he steps on my toe. Bus starts, he steps on my toe. Five times, six times, seven times. I don't say anything. The eighth time he steps on my toe, I explode. I say, God, you know, do you realize every time? And I just let him have it. He goes, hey, man, I'm sorry. That, that's what most of us do. It doesn't take a lot of energy to be passive. It doesn't to take, a, take a lot of energy to be ag ag aggressive. But that middle ground of assertiveness, guy steps on my toe once, I don't say anything. Does it a second time, I tap him on the shoulder. Excuse me, sir, I don't know if you know this, but every time the bus starts, you step on my toe. Please don't do that. 99 out of 100 times, he's going to say, I'm sorry, I didn't, know, I, didn't, I didn't know it, and he won't do it again. That takes energy. That takes self-esteem. All right? That's hard for us to do, and I encourage everybody in this room to practice it. All right? I didn't do the hardest of chemicals, but I did a lot of them frequently. If I was awake, I was high. So what that looked like is if I was doing some mundane, boring thing like, you know, doing filing papers or cleaning up my kitchen, instead of being down here, I'd be up here. I'd want to be as high as humanly possible. True story, I, I used to think, should I smoke a joint before my shower or after my shower? That was a big decision. Because if I smoke before my shower, I enjoy the shower more, but then it made me come down. So maybe I should wait till after the shower. But then if I waited till after the shower, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't having as much fun in the shower. And I used to spend, I don't know, three and a half years total of my life thinking about things like that. I used to like to brush my teeth before, I mean, I used to like to smoke before I brush my teeth in order to maximize the toothbrushing experience. Okay? So anything down here, I wanted to be up here. Then there's like the middle ground stuff, you know, going to the movies. All right, going out with friends. If everybody was here, I wanted to be up here. All right, and then God, if we ever went to a party or a concert and everybody's like up here, I wanted to be up here. So if you were to graph my life, it looked like this: one flat line. Okay. I haven't had a drink or a drug in over 16 years. If you look at my life today, it looks like this: it goes up 
and it goes down. It goes up, it goes down. I have good days, I have bad days. I have good hours, I have bad hours. I have good minutes, I have bad minutes. All right? News flash for you new guys. It's always going to be like this. It's always going to be like this. You have good days and you have bad days. The good days allow you to appreciate, you know, what's going on. When you have a bad day, you know you're going to come out of it. I go up and down. This used to be me. I was a flat line. Now I'm up and down. All right? If you ever visit me in a hospital and I'm real sick and you look at my monitors, this is what you want to see, guys. You want to see me like this. It means I'm alive. This means I was dead. Does it make sense? All right. And the last thing we're going to talk about is change. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, let me add one thing. This is, this is kind of a key thing. This trips up a lot of alcoholics. And I don't know about you guys, but I usually wear my feelings on my shoulders. So, um, you know, you, I'm a sensitive type of guy. Um, you know, I don't like to have my feelings hurt. Um, I spent a lot of time talking with my sponsor, OK, over the years about being a doormat. And that seems to trip up a lot of alcoholics. I don't know what it is, but I have this problem with everybody trying to take advantage of me, you know, take advantage of me. And so I always was concerned about being a doormat. And one day I was in a meeting and it dawned on me, you know, we started off here reading from page 83 of the big book. In fact, we read from page 83 of the big book just about every meeting. We read from it at the last meeting we started when we read the promises. But there's these two paragraphs that happened just before it. And the one we said the spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. Then there's another paragraph, which is almost like one of the most overlooked paragraphs in the big book. And it says that um, it says we should be sensible, sensible, tactful, considerate and humble without being servile or scraping. It says as God's people, we stand on our feet. We don't crawl before anyone. Okay. That's what this program does. I think, you know, I remember one time, the very first time I was able to sit still in a meeting inside my own skin and fit. You know, that's a big deal, fitting inside your skin. How does that happen? It happens because you work the other eight steps before you got to this ninth step, and then you're working 10 and 11 and 12 in your daily life. Okay. Now, what does this all add up to? What does this all add up to? This all adds up to that big C word. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Change. Okay. The same guy that came into this room or came into these rooms as a drunk alcoholic is going to drink again. It's just that way. You can't not do stuff. I don't know about you guys, but I can't not make a habit go away. Um, I drank every day. I couldn't stop drinking. I smoked every day. I couldn't stop smoking. Okay? I did a lot of things every day. I couldn't stop doing them. And all of a sudden, I had to change. And that's what happens when we go through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. When we use these tools, this kit of spiritual tools, we begin to change. Now, I remember that first sponsor, Rob, who started off as my boss and became my sponsor and then moved away, and we just became friends. He said... Very early, like I was at about three or four days sober, he said, you know, this program's real simple. You just have to change everything. In my clouded, alcoholic mind, I said, you mean I even have to change my alarm clock? And Rob said, very simply, he said, yeah, you just have to change everything. And I remember three or four years sober throwing that old alarm clock out and thinking, yeah, it changed. I had changed. Okay. Now, it's time to grow up, guys. Um, we have a saying in, uh, at the Heavy Hitters. I won't finish it, but I'll start up. It's grow up or die. And then they have a few other things they say after that. But it's grow up or die. And that's what they say in Heavy Hitters. It's grow up or die. It's time to grow up. Um, so here's some questions to ask yourself. Can I just jump right into these and finish this up, or you would do it? Okay. <clears throat> um, when I was in treatment, this guy used to ask the relapsers, the day you relapsed, can you tell me what step you were working on? The day you relapsed, did you go to a meeting? And the day you relapsed, did you ask God to keep you sober? And guess what? No one could say yes to any of those three questions. And then he went on to say, I've been asking these questions of 4,500 people who have relapsed, and I've never found one guy who said, 
Yes, I went to a, a meeting. Yes, I could tell you what step I was working on. And yes, I asked God to keep me sober. And I drank and did drugs that day. It just It's never happened. All right? Um, I, got, I got two more things. What, what do you got? Go ahead, please. First thing I want to say, to close, if those of you are not feeling real good right now, welcome to life, welcome to recovery. But what I could promise you is you're going to feel better if you stay clean and sober and get in recovery and work on your stuff. This is the only disease known to mankind where once we get better and we get over the disease and we're no longer in our disease, we're a lot healthier than we were before we got the disease. Does that, does that make sense? You got a cold, you get over the cold, you're not healthier than you were before, but you guys get, you know, get into recovery, you're going to be a lot healthier than you were when you walked in these rooms. Um, my, my, I guess it's my favorite story. This is an Indian elder, and he was teaching his, uh, his student, and he says to the student, I have two dogs inside of me. I have a good dog and a bad dog, and the two dogs are always fighting. And the student asked the question, well, who usually wins? And the elder said, whoever I feed the most. Okay? And that to me is recovery. I'm going to close with one, just one last thing that comes to mind. Um, you guys probably never had the opportunity to meet him. He moved somewhere a long time ago, way back up north. There used to be a guy that ran around Atlanta. His name was Wayno the Wino. And uh, he was great. He was just a wonderful guy. He was this big, burly guy. He had this big beard, bigger than Scotty Ashlock's, and he just was... And he talked with this thick Finnish accent. And he said, it's not that we got a second chance at life. It's that we got a new life. Guys, enjoy it. Spiritual life is not a theory. Live it. Love it. Love you guys. Now we're going to cut the tape off. We're going to just sit down and have a chat. If anybody's got any questions, wants to talk about any of this stuff, we'll just talk about staying sober for a little bit. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.